The most common mechanism for eliminations is the E2 mechanism. It shows second order kinetics, which means that both the alkyl halide and the base will appear in the rate of the reaction right there. So that is very similar to the SN2 reaction. In an SN2 reaction, the rate was determined by the alkyl halide and the nucleophile. And in this case, the rate of the reaction is determined by the alkyl halide and the base. Uh, the reaction is concerted, which means that everything happens in one step. As the base will come here, get one of the hydrogens, and form the double bond, the leaving group will leave. So everything happens in one step. So let's take a look at the mechanism. We talked about it already, but here I have my alpha carbon, that is the one that's connected to the halogen. Then the beta carbons are the ones that are one over. So that's my beta carbon, and then here I have the hydrogens. These two would also be beta carbons, but we'll talk later why uh, in this particular case, the hydrogens from those carbons um, will or will not be taken. In this case, all of them are the same, right? So this carbon is the same as this one and it's the same as this one. So it doesn't matter where I get my hydrogens. There are nine hydrogens available in total. So now I have my base. It's a really good base. It's an alkoxide. It has electron density. So it will come and get the hydrogen that it's in the beta position. That will collapse and then the BR will leave. And everything happens in just one step. Uh, so the sigma bond, two sigma bonds are broken and one pi bond is formed. If we look at the energy diagram for an E2 reaction, the reaction will happen in just one step. And this right here is the transition state. So now as the bond, as the new pi bond is forming, um, these all these bonds are going to be breaking so you see the cbr bond needs to break the ch bond needs to break this h to uh, the base bond it will be forming so here we're forming uh, one new sigma we're breaking a sigma we're forming a pi and we are breaking a sigma right so two bonds are forming and two bonds are breaking so it happens in one step, so that's why we have just one lump, and this is the activation energy. So your activation energy will come uh, from the base attacking and those bonds breaking, right? So it's just one step, so just one lump. There are many bases that can be used in E2 mechanisms. In a previous video, I talk about the alkoxide, the methoxide, the ethoxide, the terbutoxide, right? So let me just remind you, so we usually have the O minus, we have the OME minus, or we can also have the O uh, CH2, CH3, right? So that's the ethoxide. And then another very common one is going to be this one that is the terbutoxide. But we can also have bases that are uh, that have nitrogens because so these nitrogens have lone pairs that are ready to go and attack. So these two bases are going to be very common from now on in our reaction. So here we have one example using DBN as my base. So DBN, remember, is this right here. So what's going to happen is that the lone pair on the nitrogen is going to push and it's going to be the alkene right there that is going to go and get that hydrogen. Then the electrons will collapse and the leaving group will leave. And so what that will give us is the elimination, right? So here we form a new pi bond. So, and then at this point, we're gonna end up with a double bond here, and the H is going to be connected to those, to, to that nitrogen right here. And so that's exactly what we see here, right? So the lone pairs on the nitrogen went down, and then the um, electrons right here were the ones attacking. I don't need you to memorize this reaction at all, but I want you to understand the flow of electrons, right? So if I tell you that this is how the electrons flow, 
I wanted to understand why they are going in this direction instead of going in, let's say, the opposite direction. Why don't I put the arrows pointing backwards, right? So the remember that the movement of electrons, it's symbolized by these arrows. So the electrons are here and the arrow will be pointing to where the electrons want to be. Okay, so I'm just giving you one example so you can uh, see it in context. So how does the living group affect um, elimination reactions? How does the living group and the solvent affect? So, uh, the, so this bond is the one that has to break. Right? So the better the living group, the faster this reaction will happen because uh, the living group is ready to go. So remember that the larger my halogen is, the more ready it is to leave because it can stabilize that negative charge. So remember that here, iodine minus is going to be very large. So if it has electrons, it can stabilize them very well. But if I have fluorine right here, fluorine minus is very small, so it cannot stabilize those electrons so well. Oops, and I forgot to mention that the polar aprotic solvents increase the rate of E2 reaction. So let's talk about this again. So when we have polar aprotic solvents, so that means they only they don't have hydrogen. So we have um, acetone, for example. Those polar aprotic solvents will only interact with the ca the cation part of my um, of of here of my molecule right so this molecule when it breaks it forms this carbocation plus f minus and this one right here will form that carbocation plus i minus when i have a polar aprotic solvent such as acetone what will happen is that the lone pairs will be able to interact with the carbocation stabilizing it but because I don't have hydrogens and those hydrogens can, I mean, I have hydrogens, but because those hydrogens cannot interact with the fluorine or with the I minus, the, the F minus, the I minus, the Br minus, they will not stabilize it. So a polar aprotic solvent, what it will do is that it will um, stabilize the carbocation and it will leave that, uh, it will allow the, the living group to leave. So they will increase the rate. So what about the alkyl halide? So as the number of R groups on the carbon with the living group increases, the rate of the E2 reaction increases. And the reason for that is because when you have an alkyl halide tertiary just like this one, what you will get is a more substituted alkene. When you have an alkyl halide such as this one that is primary, you will get a less substituted alkene. And remember that the alkenes that are more stable are the ones that are more substituted. So the more substituted the alkyl halide, the more substituted the alkene, and therefore these will be uh, the faster ones or the or they the rate will be faster for an E2 reaction the more substituted the alkyl halide is. So I'm going to say that one more time. Um, for an SN2 reaction it will happen faster the least, um, for the least substituted alkyl halide because it will have, so if I have a nucleophile here, the nucleophile can simply come and leave. When you have something more complicated like a tertiary alkyl halide, it's crowded so the nucleophile cannot really reach that electrophilic side. But when you have an elimination, an E2, what happens is that the more substituted my alkyl halide is, the more substituted will be my resulting alkene. And the more substituted the resulting alkene, the more stable it will be. So that's why tertiary alkyl halides will react faster in an E2 fashion. And uh, we've seen this before. This is how the transition state for an E2 mechanism will look like. So here we have the alkyl halide and here I have my base uh, and the hydrogen that it's taken away. So these two are the two bonds that are being formed. So a, a pi and a sigma. 
and then in another color I'm going to mark the ones that are being broken so that one will be broken and that will be that other one will be broken So in summary, um, an E2 reaction, it's a second other reaction. It happens in one step. And the more substituted my alkyl halide, the more the faster that it will happen. An E2 reaction is favored by strong bases such as methoxide, terbutoxide. So that's terbutoxide, methoxide, alkoxide. Uh, then we have DBU etc and so the better the living group the faster the reaction and it's favored by polar aprotic solvents and here we have one example of an e2 reaction in in organic synthesis and that's in the synthesis of quinine so what happens here is that we have terbutoxide Again, we've seen that many times today. So terbutoxide will come and get that hydrogen. So remember, this is going to be my alpha carbon. This is going to be my beta carbon. So now terbutoxide can come, get that proton that will collapse, and then the living group will leave. And that's how I get my alkene. I'm going to do the exact same, he exact same thing here. So I have DBU that you know it's a base. So DBU will come and get the beta hydrogen. So this is my alpha right there, and this is going to be my beta. So the DBU comes, right? DBU has a lone pair, comes, collapses, and that will leave, and that's how I get that alkene form.